After waking up with a jolt, the girl laid in bed a few seconds longer, reaching over the switch on her bedside lamp. She tried to remember exactly what happened, but she couldn't. The brunette swung her legs over to the side of the bed and heaved herself up. Checking the time on her phone, she snorted when she saw it was midnight. The witching hour. Knowing that sleep would only evade her, she left her bedroom for the kitchen. A good cup of coffee in her mind. As she passed by her front door, a chill spread like a liquid fire down her spine. It's only winter, she told herself, focusing again on the coffee plant, measuring out scoops of water, preparing her cup kept her occupied. But as the dark liquid boiled, she had nothing left to keep her mind from wandering off. The chill returned, and she couldn't help but glance behind her in front of the door. It stood there innocently, though, just like always. The dead bolt was still in place, and she could see nothing amiss with it. Turning back to her coffee, she did her best to forget about that feeling. With her cup in hand, she started to walk towards her bedroom. As she walked by the front door, she decided that a quick glance of the peephole would help calm her restless mind. The chill worsened with each step she took towards the door and further away from the safety and warmth of her blankets. She passed her empty hand against the cold metal door and took a deep breath before leading her eye through the people. At first, she could only see inky blackness and somehow seemed to swirl in itself. But she blinked in surprise. The void melted away. She wished it hadn't. In its place, there stood what, I guess what would be a man. The limbs were inhumanly awkward, with bulky joints branching off into several arms, not unlike the branches of a tree. The creature was draped in a black suit, somehow making the thing more nightmarish to her. She shoved herself away from the door, with the hand still pressed against it. The scaling mug of coffee fell, the liquid burning her bare legs as she fell backwards and tried to crawl away from the door. She knew somehow, in her mind, has not been playing tricks on her. As she crab walked away from the door, she watched the tendrils of the black void she first saw through the cracks. The girl was trapped between instinct to flee and the gut feeling not to turn her back to the door. When the door jolted, the urge to flee overcame her, and she slipped in the burning liquid as she tried to make it back to her room. She knew, deep down, that she was trapping herself in a corner, but she had to get away from the door. The girl was halfway down the hallway when she heard the previously locked door creak open. She screamed, and slipped into a wall, cracking her chin on it and stunning her. After that, it was only blackness. Nicole? A warm male voice snapped the woman out of her trance. As she turned around, it was met by one of the sister's doctors. She nodded, not sure if she should say anything, or even if she should find her voice. That morning, she had gotten an urgent phone call from the hospital, saying that her sister, Lindsay, was there. Before they had even let her see her, the doctor had pulled her off to the side and insisted that they talk to her about what might have happened. Phrases like self-inflicted and assault had been thrown around. Nicole felt her mind reel. She still hadn't fully understood what they had been saying until she saw Lindsay out with her own eyes. Her little sister had a bandage wrapped around her head, covering both her ears as well as her eyes. They said it was hard to keep her now. Deadened eyes from drying out to try to keep the infection out of the wounds Lindsay made on her ears. The doctors had guessed that either she or someone else jammed a pencil on them to keep her off balance or to deafen herself against something. There was the mix of 
first and second degree burns on her hands and legs from what was assumed the coffee from her cup. As Nicole walked into her sister's hospital room for the first time, she thought that she had spied the silhouette of a man in the window that she knew was impossible because her sister's room was on the third story of the hospital. Did you ever come and stumble upon an anime that you just love all of a sudden? Well, I've seen Naruto grow popular and saw their gaming, but never had thought of even watching the series. This all changed in 2008. I became so obsessed that I even bought DVDs. That is, until I stumbled upon what was almost like a lost file in one of these DVDs. Like most of the fans, I would go online and wait and wait for the new Japanese English subtitled episodes to be released on some kind of website. When they wouldn't post a new episode until three weeks passed, I went to watch Naruto, the DVDs I bought, instead of watching them on the TV. I decided I wanted to play it on my new laptop that I bought for my college years. I did not buy these DVDs on any official sites though. Instead, I bought these when they were first made, not edited or anything company whom sells them, you see. I had one of those Italis BFFs who would just do anything for you, so he did this for me. Of course, these newly unedited DVDs were obviously Japanese, so I can never understand a word it said. I just saw these animations move on by. When watching this on my laptop, I was wondering if I could insert my own English subtitles, just for the laugh. I could probably make Naruto say fuck you instead of damn it. So I tried to edit the DVD, but with using Microsoft Silverlight software, I wish I never did this. I stumbled upon what seemed to be a frame of an episode, meaning almost like a hidden message. I was toying around with the editing software, clicking frame by frame. I could see Naruto's eyes all bloodshot, looking actually realistic. I thought, oh, Sakura must have punched him in this scene. I was terribly wrong. Naruto was just staring at the screen every time. I used this frame by frame and I skimmed throughout this, seeing Naruto the same way each time, over and over, till it finally stopped. My whole laptop shut down and rebooted. I was scared, petrified. It was pretty freaky. Once it rebooted, nothing special happened until 30 seconds passed. It showed Hidan using one of his joshiness techniques. I guess that when rebooting it just continued the episode I was on. It then paused, showing Hidan's black and white face. Due to his joshin technique, it then showed Shikamaru's face, then the episode began to look like those old movies where it had black spots appear from time to time, making it look like it was burnt. It then began to cripple, turning down. Then the black and white, like those old movies, continued playing the episode, while Hidan said words I never do anime characters would say. This was an unedited episode, but Hidan said something in English instead of Japanese voiceovers. Hidan even sounded like the English voice actor. It was almost a demonic voice. Hidan said, Run, run, cling to life. I will come for you, Rabin. I'm now part of your life. I'm your body. I am a part of you. Then it showed Hidan stabbing himself. Asuma fell on the ground like he used to, dying. It then replayed this over and over, 
After five times of looping, my webcam that's installed on my laptop came on. I could tell since the green light next to it popped up. Then it turned back off. But my face came upon Asuma's, like a horrible Photoshop. I force shut down my laptop and drove to my friend's house. I came up to his house, rang the doorbell, but no answer. After pressing the doorbell three times, someone finally opened. It was my friend's mother. I asked her where he was, but she just started sobbing, asked her what was wrong. And her reply was that she said that he died, he began to have a seizure, and it was just too much. She shut the door, and all I could hear was sobbing from inside her house. What the hell is going on? I went to my mother's friend's house, since I was too fucking scared to go back to mine. I went to his computer and did a little research on Hedon. He was a Joshinist, so to actually activate his technique he needed some type of A in a circle to step in. I began to sob. <laughs> but I was thankful it was 5pm. So the light shined in the room. I didn't want to be in the dark. I was so scared to even sleep, because all I could see was the darkness. I never went anywhere without my friend. I brought about three of my friends, including the one that went to, I went to the sleepover with, to my dorm. I wanted to be safe. I turned on my laptop and nothing happened. It showed the Toshiba screen with my applications on the desktop. I popped open my CD slash DVD inserter, and the DVD was still in there. I closed it back in, then I clicked on the button that said, DVD inside. I pressed play, and went to Microsoft Silverlight. Every time I tried to open it, it automatically closed. My computer rebooted once more, and my webcam automatically turned on. When it came back to my Toshiba screen, Hidon was right on my screen again. Then it showed the badly photoshopped people. Hidon was killing, but with my friends' faces, we all were scared, but I pleaded them not to leave. They stayed, since they knew they were safe and were all together. We still began to panic, but there's Hidon's face on my screen. He wanted us to converse with him. We all thought this was stupid, but we did it anyway. This is what we said. Who are you? I'm everything. Why are you doing this? For reasons I don't even know myself. Why don't you stop? I probably will soon. How can we help you stop? Give me another soul to haunt. How did you kill my friend? I am everything. I am diseases. I am your friend. My screen shut off. I couldn't turn it back on. We all knew what we had to do. I took the DVD out of my computer, put it back into the case. I made a garage sale in one of my friend's houses. A 15-year-old boy bought this. My heart began beating as images ran through my head. All I could see was Hedon stabbing himself over and over in the joshiness circle. One of my friends saw me doing nothing, so we just sold the DVD to the boy. I came back to reality, seeing the boy walk away with the DVD case in his hands. I felt sad and relieved. Please be warned, it's still out there. I should have just got rid of the damn thing. Believe me or not. The overwhelming majority of your actions in life will have no effect on your eternal condition. After all, does a grain of sand ever have any effect on a prodigious star? Of course it doesn't. The star cannot even discern the grain of sand. 
let alone is it affected by the sand's significance. The grain of sand is negligible, as is the condition of most of your life. The good deeds you perform, your philanthropy, your positive mindset, your hate, your murder, your lust, none of these things matter. None of these things determine whether you go to heaven or hell after you die. Heaven and hell do not exist as objective places. All that exists is what the individualized mind believes. Therefore, the conditions of heaven and hell are contingent upon the individual's particular notions. To be more specific, roughly 99.9 .9 of your life is immaterial, and this is the initial 99.9% .9 of your life. All that truly matters is that last 0.1%. This small fraction is paramount. All that matters is your state of mind in the precise moment before death brings down his heavy, rusty scythe. Your state of mind in this fleeting, unexpected moment will remain this way forever. And at some point, in the inconceivable eternity following death, we'll forget about everything irrecomparably diminutive in life. The final emotion is the only thing that remains, and it never dies. You exist only as the single distilled emotion, or a combination of emotions, detached from your body, forever. This truth is fortunate for the 0.1% of the human population, whose last 0.1% of life was pleasant. November 16, 1995. While at Asunabar Island on the coast, I met a strange Pokemon. It looks like blocks, but together, and made a backwards L. So after observing it, I decided to catch it. November 19th, 1995. After observing the strange creature, I decided to see how it fought in a Pokemon battle. After training it, it seems it uses water gun a lot and sky attack. So in conclusion, I think it's a normal slash flying type. November 20th, 1995. Today it evolved into a Kangaskhan for some odd reason. It looked like a normal... What? But it had an egg in its pouch. November 23rd, 1995. The egg hatched, but the Kangaskhan won't care for it at all. I try to feed it and play with it, but it still won't do anything. November 24th, 1995. I've decided to give the infant Pokemon to a trainer in Lavender Town. He said he would take good care of her. November 30th, 1995. After the long drive to Lavender Town, I met the young boy. He said thanks for the Kangaskhan. December 1st, 1995. The young boy called me from the Pokemon Center and said that she went missing. December 3rd, 1995. I've decided to help the boy find the young Pokemon. Who knows what trouble it's gotten into. December 9th, 1995. After a long drive, I arrived. He told me while looking for a Cubone, it was very rare, and answered his call. December 10th, 1995. My hypothesis says that a wild Kangaskhan infant will find a skull and become a Cubone. That's what I think happened to her. December 15th, 1995. The boy's been treating the Cubone well, which was good to hear, but I still wonder why the Kangaskhan didn't take care of her infant. December 17th, 1995. I've decided to let Kangaskhan free. I'll miss her, but it's better this way. 
December 24th, 1995. It's Christmas Eve, and I'm going to spend Christmas with Blue and Daisy this year. December 25th, 1995. The boy contacted me and told me that the Cubone evolved into a Marowak and had an egg. I was surprised, because he hadn't had her for a long time. January 24th, 1996. Red and Green finally decided to become trainers, so I supplied Green with an Eevee and Red with a Pikachu. Also, the Marowak's egg is hatched today. February 12th, 1996. The evil Team Rocket killed Marowak and left the Cubone alone. Green explained it all. Also, he told me that his Raticate died. Red told me that a strange ghost has blocked the path to Mr. Fuji. February 17th, 1996. Red told me the ghost was the Marowak that Team Rocket killed. I was shocked at this information when he told me. December 14th, 1997. I found out that Kangaskhan was a missing link in Pokemon Science, so I decided to name it Missing Now. Hello, everyone, two, 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 nine, nine. I would like to lick the blood out of the person. I see your handsome face. Don't be so sad about it. Come on. Holy fuck. What the fuck? Did that just happen? Yes, Skull. Yes, it just did. The first thing I should probably note is that I'm Lemon Lime Skull. In other words, that's my screen name up there. That was the first time I saw or heard from Funny Mouth. And for all intents and purposes, it should have been the last. Anyone who's spent enough time chatting always knows that weirdos come and go. Folks pop in to ask insane questions, or just to troll a populated channel. What first struck me as odd about the Funny Mouth guy, however, was the fact that he came and went with no particular goal. He didn't try to piss anyone off, and he didn't ask anyone on the channel. He knew how to fix his computer or remove a virus. He just stuck his head in rattled off some text, and happily fucked off. So really though, what the hell? Not a clue. He's in another channel if you want to find out, at Blued. I do not, sir. Bitch. I don't know what results I expected from following this guy to another channel. I'm not the type that goes out of his way to annoy or argue with people. I usually avoid it at all costs. But once someone starts with me, I don't mind going into that point. I guess what I'm saying is I have no idea why I pursued this. Hey, he was sitting there in the channel by himself. So... So you're staring at me. That's rude. Sorry. I just do it. It's okay. I see. I actually laughed out loud at this point. He was weird and inoffensive. You can come back to the reefer sales if you want. We're not going to boot you if that's what you're worried about. Or not. Whatever, man. You just seem interested in I'm bored tonight. I am bored tonight, too. I always don't. You always don't what? I always don't. 
that's it. I always don't because they don't and then I get silly. Okay, well, see you around. And with that, I left. The act got old fast, and I felt either this was someone trying too hard, or a legitimate moron who was unaware of how to properly use a chat program, sitting idly by yourself and popping into other channels for a split second seemed like a desperate bit for attention. I might have done that and laughed my ass off in around the 90s, but yeah, stupid. Hmm. Nothing. I seriously don't know what he's saying. Huh. <laughs> Welcome to the internet. What's sad is that, besides you and me, that guy's the only other active user here all night. Wake up! Bly. Silence dominated the channel for about half an hour as I minimized the window and went about my business. Anyone on? Nothing. Eight users in the channel, not a single one active. Boring. Why are people so boring? Wake up! It took me a few seconds to see it. Funny mouth again. Staring again. I physically slum my shoulders with a not this shit again sigh. Then I noticed he wasn't in the channel. Anyone else see him? Of course not, because you're idle. Obviously, it was a glitch with either my client or the server. The message was kicked up from earlier in the night. At random, these things happen. Still, it creeped the hell out of me. After a few minutes of sitting there with a really cold, creepy feeling in my stomach, that's I shouldn't have done something feeling. I decided to stop trying to brave it out and just close out the entire chat program. Sure, I could just have hung out like everyone was fine, but why bother to try and prove I wasn't spooked? Hell, nobody was even around to see me slink away. After a few more hours screwing around on the web, I went to bed at around 2.40 a.m. One thing I've always prided myself on is that I do not have nightmares, at least not regularly, usually. If there are any monsters or ghosts or nuclear wars in my dream, I get to control it and I have a great time. I'm shooting zombies in the face, outright telling ghosts they're not real, while I laugh at them. And if there is some disaster, I always know how to get to the safe spot, while every other MF's fries. I've had maybe four actual nightmares in the past 10 years, and yes, I'm completely serious. The first nightmare of my adult life was in 2005. I had just broken off a relationship with someone who had been someone else for over a year behind my back. That night, when I finally did get to sleep, I dreamt she was strapped down to a medical table, while some sort of unseen, inexplicable creature sucked her brain out through an organic machine. The brain screamed ceaselessly. The second nightmare had me visiting a medical facility where they were experimenting with a new method of saving lives. There was a fantastic tour of this high-tech facility. Lots of wonders of modern science, people in lab coats, etc. Then, I was led to a room where three car crash victims had been saved by their technique. This included a slowly rocking young girl whose face had been completely distended and hung around her chest, and a woman with nothing but a cluster of twitching, severed limbs, all held together by a drawn-out, kite-like span of flesh. The third came soon after the second. I was being astonished by the two people, one who wanted to insult me to no end, 
and the other who kept trying to pinch the tweak me in absurdly ineffective ways. Thinking I would control the stream like others, I set the two men against each other, thinking it would be some co sort of poetic justice. Instead, the pincher became increasingly violent until he was pulling out the other's cheeks, grabbing his tongue with his fist and fiercely pulling it until it came out. Then he pulled the fellow's eyelids until they distended in some sort of grotesque prolapse. I suppose that I'm getting at this is even when I did have nightmares, I was never actually target of any sort of horror. It's always been a kind of empathetic horror related to someone else getting brutalized. This night, however, was different. As soon as I fell asleep, I started dreaming. Basically, it was a reoccurring dream I have where I'm in the woods, just checking out animals and birds, generally acting chill. I lie in the grass and look up at the sky. It's always a dream I welcome. Because if I've had a shit day, I'll wake up happy and ready to start over. This time, the script changed. I laid in the grass, but while I was staring at the sky, I felt something odd. It was a cold, squirming feeling on my neck. In the dream, I reached to my neck and pulled away a long, withering earthworm. Earthworms disgust me. If I see one in the yard, I'll specifically get a shovel and heap dirt over it, simply I don't accidentally see it again. Disgusted, but more or less content, I flung the worm aside and continued my dream. Then, that feeling again, clammy, wet, wiggling against the side of my neck. I pulled another earthworm away. Again it happened. The third time, the feeling of confusion and dread became so overwhelming that I immediately wrapped myself out of the dream. That's what usually happens when shit gets real. Game over. I figured it out though. At least, I thought I had. In the waking world, I felt my neck and discovered a slick, slimy film on the skin. Logic dictated that I must have been drooling in my sleep. Nothing to be proud of, but not exactly terrifying either. My dreaming mind must have translated the icky feeling into an appropriate creature in the forest stream. Perhaps more unsettling though, was the fact that the bed around me seemed to have indentions, or to be exact, it was almost as someone on hands and knees had been hovering over me as I slept. There was any number of reasons that could have happened, but from then on that night, I slept very lightly. Any little thing, like the sound of a ceiling fan, would wake me up straight. I had no real interest in going back to the woods that night. When morning came around, I got ready to take off, to get out of the house and shake the cowbells out. I only planned to check my email real quick to make sure I didn't have any pending transactions or questions I had to answer. Surprise! I had a good time to talk to you. It can be fun again. You'll see what. I don't like stop it. As you probably recall, I hadn't given this asshat my email address. However, logical answer, someone else on the chat must have. He obviously came back to the reefer sales. As someone who I was, and that douchebag completely betrayed me, knowing I don't give out my personal contact info. Although, the email was dated 2.40. That was pretty much the moment I had went to bed, 
when everyone on the channel was still idle. Even though I well and truly knew I was taking some sort of bait, I responded. Um, yeah, bro, not exactly sure I want you emailing me. It was clear and to the point. There's no mistaking the message I was sending. And though it was snippy, I wasn't groating him to reply by starting a flame war. But of course... Come on, don't be so sad about it. I, I know you can like it. We, we will have fun a lot of the time. And with that, I blocked his address. Really, I should have done that in the first place. But I still have some sick sort of interest in exactly where this was going. Maybe if I put my foot down, he would admit he was just screwing around and call me humorless wet blanket. When I was saw it, it was just the same old bullshit. It gave me the green light to go ahead and shut the guy out. For what it's worth, you can relax at this point. The blocking stuck. There's no follow-up messages circumventing the ban. After a few minutes, I assured myself that it was all over, and I went about my day. It wasn't until I got home at dusk that the cold, squirming feeling in my stomach started all over again, and I had no idea why. Well, that's not entirely true. I had some idea. I checked my email. Nothing from Funny Mouth. However, there was an email from George. Hey, refersales.com is fucked up. I can't get shit to load. When you're online, please take a look at it ASAP. Peace and carrots, George. I let out a string of curses. Down the time meant lost sales. And I had been out of the day, and no way for George to contact me. If I'd been in a little less strict with my personal info, he could have just called me. I loaded the site and waited for some sort of error screen. Instead, it began to reroute to another page, blue.com. Yeah, I see it. It's redirecting to a website with a giant pixelated face with a messed up tongue. I think this has to be that funny mouth POS. Did you give him my email with the domain in it? And George emailed me a screenshot of the site giving a 404 error, along with a coming soon notice for blue.com. I could have easily faked them, but why? I mean, if this was some sort of joke, it was pretty abstract and I didn't get it. When I looked at the website files, everything was normal, nothing out of place. Nobody had even logged in to change anything. I checked the domain name and the name servers. The thing that routes a domain where it's supposed to go, and nothing was out of sort. Still. There was this bloated, tongue-wangling face looking back at me with its empty eye sockets. And then, I don't know how I missed it in the first place. Looking closely, the picture of that face wasn't really pixelated. It was made of tiny letters, HTML code coloring each letter specific to the image. Over and over again, the word that made up the image was right out in front of me. Funny mouth, funny mouth, funny mouth, funny mouth. And a great cluster of nonsense. I felt like spitting at the screen. I unblocked his email address and set about writing an incredibly profane and threatening letter. I didn't really care if I got the site back at this point. I just wanted to get everything off my chest 
so I can feel like I was in control of this situation again. Before I could finish the letter, I just got this weird, creepy feeling again. That, no, it couldn't be a feeling. Where you know you're being absurd, but at the same time, you know you're right. I stopped hacking about my death threats, checked the inbox. I see your hand some face. Not only was that feeling correct, a feeling that he had already emailed me the minute I unblocked him. But it seemed he had steadily been emailing me non-stop since I blocked him. Ten more letters arrived within the time span it took me to reply. Fucking stop. I was getting a stress headache. My heart was pounding, not from fear, but rage. This is probably the most absurdly infuriating person on the internet. And that's saying a lot. Thankfully, a string of letters did indeed stop. I tried to calm myself down, breathing deeply, but it didn't seem to take. I was still incredibly pissed. Slowly, methodically, I sent him another note. Hi. I understand what you're saying, and I do not understand what you want. I think there may be a language barrier. Is your first language English? I think you have done something to my website, and I'd like you to undo it. If you were mad at me, I did not intend this to happen. You may have misunderstood what I said, or what I meant. Please change my website back, and let's both go our separate ways. Thank you. I waited. I thought about it, how I conquered my anger, and that this measured response was really the best way to go about it. This fellow would understand what I meant. He'd realized the mistake he'd made. I calmed down. Everything was going to be okay. Then... I hit the roof. I hit the goddamn roof and went clear through it. I smacked the monitor with my palm. Knocking it clear off the desk. It pissed me off even more. As I drove my fist into the keyboard repeatedly until the keys flew free. I screamed out in a mixture of frustration with myself and rage over the situation, stormed out of the room, knocking down anything and everything I could get my hands on. For as long as I could imagine the energy, I laid waste to my own shit. I wouldn't start at a fire and burn the fucking place down if I had a lighter on my hand. That night. I stared at the ceiling for what felt like an eternity before sleep came. And waiting for sleep. I knew I was going to have a nightmare. I just knew it. That was my own luck was going. I imagined how surprised I was, even in sleep. When instead of something horrific setting, I was someplace safe. The woods. I laid in the grass again. I felt relaxation. I knew, even my subconscious knew, that everything would be okay. No matter what setbacks life threw at me, the world would go on. Nothing was permanent. Everything in the transition, and nobody would really get to me. I felt the squirming against my neck. Nope, no dice. Nothing could spoil this right now. I ignored the worm. It would go away. I felt the squirming moved in my mouth. Now, I couldn't with myself awake. Every other time, I'd been able to decide, wake up. But it seemed like that opportunity had now passed. Then, it wasn't a worm. It was a finger. And another. Then more until four slimy, squirming digits were locked around my teeth, clutching my lower jaw. 
It didn't hurt when it happened. It was just sort of like a pop. More pressure than pain. It was quick. And before I even knew what was going on, it was over. I then managed to force myself awake. I sat up and got to my feet in complete darkness. Feeling my way around the walls, I made my way into the bathroom. There, I finally flicked a light switch. I stood before the mirror, rubbing my eyes as the harsh light blinded me. I stared in the mirror for a few minutes, no end, with no reaction, no feelings, no thoughts. Then I smiled. I smiled as best as I could. Now that my jaw was completely broken, hanging loose around my neck, my tongue lolled out listlessly, like a paralyzed, gooey slug. My teeth weren't rooted in anything but threads of flesh. I could pull them out by hand, with about the same discomfort as a needle prick. I laughed, the halting sound coming out like the gurgling of backed up sewer drain. What a handsome face. What a funny mouth. A funny mouth. I see your handsome face. Don't be so sad about it. Hey Charles, where the fuck were you? Charles? Hello? Do you remember the shows that were on during the Golden Age, such as Ringu, Ren and Stimpy, Sonic Satan, and Rugrats? Well, during some research online, a lost cartoon short called The Jersey Devil was found. Lost deep within the bowels of development hell, it was cancelled because it was considered too grim and too dark, even to air on Halloween. The short starts off with a TV view of an episode from Spongebob. Then we see the figure of an unknown boy sitting in bed, all gripped with fear. He begins to talk about a little accident, which left him scared for life. The real beginning of the short shows a log cabin somewhere within the Pine Barrens, which is supposedly home of the Jersey Devil. The boy is then seen walking through these said woods, unaware of said dangers that await him. A quick but startling glimpse of a demon-like creature pops out into the screen, which knocks the boy down. Immediately after the boy falls, a horrifying scene starts up. Multiple pictures of death and demonic possession and evil pop-ups onto the screen, each one worse than the last. The boy gets up from his little seizure. Unfortunately, what he sees is much less pleasant than the demonic scene. A picture of the Jersey Devil is shown. Its eyes have red and black stuff coming out of them. Its wings are all torn and bloody. Its mouth is its mouth is so wrong and jagged. Almost a destroying look of teeth. And its entire figure isn't anything to look at either. The unknown boy starts running away with the creature in hot pursuit. He eventually gets to the house he was planning to stay in, where he grabs a sniper rifle from underneath the lawn chair proceeds to shoot the monster in the head, which knocks it unconscious. We are then treated to what appears to be a live animation, in which the boy mentions his newly developed fear of the paranormal and that he will never again underestimate the possibilities of the unknown. After that, the figure of the demonic creature appears, walking past the window before it stares at the camera with a blank, deathly stare. Then the credits roll, but they aren't like the ones you would expect. They're just a bunch of random text, which appears to have been typed using the infamous Zalgo font. If one manages to sit through the credits, another short starts playing. The victim this time is some unknown hunter carrying a rifle, intending to shoot something. 
but what comes up after is another picture of the Jersey Devil, accompanied with vicious animal growls and the scream of a man. The next part is nothing but a shot of the hunter's hand, which is accompanied with the sounds of chewing, a little glimpse of a torn wing. Deleted levels in video games have always been the source of fascination for gamers, and one of the best known examples of them are the four deleted zones in Sonic 2, Hidden Palace, Wood Zone, Dust Hill, and Genocide City. They are all listed on the level select screen of a publicly available Sonic 2 beta. Hidden Palace and Wood Zone can be partially played, and there is an old preview picture of what was believed to be Dust Hill. Genocide City, however, is a mystery. Selecting it, and the beta will simply load a blank screen, where Sonic will instantly fall to his death. The lack of information, and excessively threatening name, have made this zone one of the biggest mysteries in gaming. Recently, I came across what was claimed to be a complete beta of Sonic 2 which had all the missing zones intact and fully playable. I was skeptical that such a thing existed, since deleted levels were, you know, cut, because they were never finished, so it wouldn't even make sense. But the download description claimed every zone to be completed, and removed, for an unexplained reason. I started playing this beta, aside from Tails not being present, and gameplay. He was on the title screen. The game initially seemed identical to the final version. After completing Green Hill and Chemical Plant Zone, however, I ended up in Dust Hill. Dust Hill was pretty similar to the screenshot. Standard desert themed level. The oddly slow banjo music in the background was a little unsettling, but everything else was normal. Just like a normal Sonic 2 zone. The Robotnik boss, his standard vehicle with robotic arms shooting laser guns. Although they fired standard energy bullets, after Dust Hill, I went through the Aquatic Ruins, Casino Night, and Hill Top Zone with no differences. From the ones in the final game. After Hill Top, I entered Wood Zone. Like Dust Hill, this fit perfectly. With the exception of some odd textures and carved wood platforms, they looked almost like faces. The music had a tribal feel to it. Robotnik was fought on a new floating platforms above, and a spiked pit. He used an axe attachment to his vehicle to eliminate platforms and attack you. In Mystic Cave Zone, I noticed the first difference from the final version, besides the added levels. I collected the seventh Chaos Emerald in it. I didn't get any message about Supersonic, just Sonic got them all message. I couldn't turn into Supersonic either. After completing the Oil Ocean, I went to the Hidden Palace Zone. It was pretty much like the version in the well-known beta, nothing unusual until I got to the end of the second act. Tails was tied to the Master Emerald. Robotnik was hovering above him, doing a laughing animation. Sonic turned into Super Sonic and ran past the Master Emerald, grabbing Tails right before Robotnik fired a gigantic beam, shattering the Emerald. I got a message saying, Sonic saved Tails, and the screen faded. Metropolis Zone started. I could change into Super Sonic with 50 rings now, and Tails was following me. The rest of the game was like the normal version. Genocide City Zone never showed up. Confused about Genocide City's absence, I looked around online, trying to find information about the version I had just played. I couldn't find anything, so I decided replaying the game without the Chaos Emeralds. Everything in the game was identical, until I reached the Hidden Palace. Tails was still tied to the Emerald, and Robotnik was still above him. Sonic ran to the Emerald to try to save Tails, but Robotnik fired the energy beam diagonally, knocking Sonic back. Robotnik fired his huge beam at the Master Emerald, hitting Tails this time. I heard a loud, high-pitched shriek, which I guess was supposed to be the voice of Tails. When the beam went away, Tails and the Master Emerald were both gone without a trace. Robotnik did a laughing animation and flew away. Sonic did an animation. 
I had never seen him do before, where he fell to the ground and just laid there. The words, you couldn't save him, appeared on the screen, and the level faded out. The next zone, as I was expecting, was Genocide City. When it loaded, it was a blank screen. Just like the well-known beta, Sonic fell to the bottom and died. I had 14 lives then, and this following sequence repeated itself 13 times. When I was down to one life though, the level finally loaded. The best way I can describe the graphics is a combination of chemical plant and metropolis zone, with many objects in the background on fire. The music seemed to be a remix of the title music, but played with nothing but bass tones. There didn't seem to be any rings in the zone. So, being down in my last life, I proceeded with caution. There didn't seem to be any enemies in the zone either. More and more animals appeared as I went deeper in the level. Soon, the floors were covered with them. The only challenges in the level were some simple platforming sequences. I had to jump over gaps. And the floor led to a burning fire at the bottom of the screen. After going through what felt like a normal Sonic 2 level in length, I reached the goal sign. There was a small gap between the floor and the goal sign. After touching at the sign, instead of running like Sonic usually does, Sonic turned around and just looked at the direction of the gap for 30 seconds. He ran into it, falling to his death. I got the game over screen. What? I had forgotten that I had a couple continues earlier in the game. I selected the yes continue option, but I heard an ear splitting buzzing noise, like games do when you choose the menu option you aren't allowed to. I tried a couple more times, but the game clearly wasn't going to let me continue. I finally chose no. In the game over screen, similar to the bad ending in Sonic 1, except of juggling emeralds, Robotnik was juggling the bodies of the creatures you free. I'd reset the game to get away from that title screen. I was disturbed by what I had just seen. This certainly explained why Genocide City had been removed from the game. But I couldn't imagine what made Sega even consider doing something like this. Even though I had already played the game through and gotten to the good ending, I felt like I had to do it again. That I could leave the game the way I played the second playthrough. So far, the third time in one day, I started the Sonic 2 beta. The first oddity was the title screen. Tails was gone from it. Sonic didn't seem to notice. There was a bit of empty space in the circle of them coming out of. I started the game and it seemed normal until I collected 50 rings when I entered the first bonus stage. Instead of rings coming at me wave after wave, bombs appeared. I dodged for as long as I could, but I finally got hit. Instead of doing his lose ring animation, the 3D Sonic model died with the death animation, and the bonus stage ended. The results screen listed zero for every stat, but the message at the top was different. In solid black text, it said, You can't bring back the dead. Getting really scared at this point, I collected another 50 rings as quickly as I could. But the bonus stage I entered was identical to the ending with the same message. I deleted the beta from my computer and downloaded it again so I can get the good ending again. I nearly screamed when I saw the title screen without the tails on it as I feared I got the impossible bonus stage again, but this time the message was different when I lost. You can't reverse your mistakes. I was terrified and was clinging to the irrational belief that if I could just get a good ending again, everything would be better. I went on a different computer, downloaded the beta, got the same title screen. Acting on baseless instinct by this point, I went to the bonus stage again. The message this time. You have to accept your mistakes. I deleted the beta from that computer as well. I realized that the computers were sharing an internet source and that that was a possibility that it was some kind of trick or virus. I went to my trusty Genesis, took out the Sonic 2 cart, 
that I had for 17 years. If I could just see tails in it, I knew everything would be okay. But I still haven't gotten up the courage to risk it. Every rational part of me knows the beta couldn't possibly affect my cartridge. But I'm too afraid. Afraid of what will happen if I see the title screen without tails in it. I dream about it every night. But I just know that it will get so much worse. The last pale stripes of light were fading quickly behind the city's expanse that evening. The street, still damp from a recent rain, glimmered thinly. The street lights had not yet flickered to life, and the street was hanging suspended in that breathless, squinting moment between light and dark. I was on my way home from what had been a difficult job, leaving me exhausted and grim. I took long steps. My hands balled into fists, shoved deep into my pockets. It was chilly, not biting cold, but a murmuring one. Cold that sent its pallid hands lightly creeping along your skin. Whispers of touch that raised goosebumps. Hair in suspension. I felt my heart rate quicken, my breathing become labored. I paused, eyes fluttering shut. I heard the muted crunch of a single footstep behind me, then nothing, there was someone following me. I set off at a dead run, all springs and gears turning, now that there was no mistaking it. I most certainly had a pursuer, I didn't look back, I only ran. My feet slapped the pavement hard, jarring, we ran together, my pursuer and I. A manic, high stakes dance, through Hyde streets back alleys, and over garbage cans. Finally, we reached my street. I jumped one-handed over a fence, through the backyard, and ran to my front stoop. I reached my front door, a mad scramble with my keys. I knew if I could make it in the basement before I was caught, I would be home free. I ran to the basement door, shoved it open, then tore down the stairs, jumping down the last two steps before hiding in the shadows. My pursuer showed as he crept down the steps of my basement, each foot descending further into the murky gloom. A weak ray of light shining down on the basement stairs allowed me to see my pursuer's hand brushing and feeling his way along the cold basement wall, searching for a light switch. I heard his every breath, ragged, heavy, and wet, and his hand met with the light switch, and it quickly flicked on. I watched as the man in the blue uniform stood frozen in terror as his gaze swept over the room. From the blood-stained walls to the gory freezer in the corner to what was left of my previous dinner on the surgical table, he didn't hear me creep up behind him, but he must have felt the throbbing bulge in my pants as I emptied a full syringe into the flesh of his neck. Well, officer, I whispered to the policeman's ear as his bloody body went limp. Looks like you've solved the case. He 
grab your pistol and your knife and rush to the only room without a window. You then quickly barricade the door with anything you could find, mainly a bed, a dresser, and a nightstand. You know, it's here. They or he, you don't know what it is, you just know it's looking for you. You quietly but quickly rush to the farthest corner of the room. Then you hear pots and pans crashing to the floor. A loud ear-piercing screech from the kitchen. You then hear doors banging open, banging sounds coming from every single room. You hear it and feel vibrations of the creature stomping on the other side of the door. You then start to clutch the gun in your left hand and the knife in your right. Everything gets quiet. Nothing, not even the sound of deep breathing reaches your ears for a good ten minutes. You don't move a muscle. You don't even breathe. You wait a little more, just to be sure you're safe. Two hours pass by, not even a peep, not a sound. You let out a sigh of relief, and just when you thought you were alone, you hear multiple voices in different tones say, I knew you were in there. Behind you, you quickly get away from the wall to see the words written in blood on the wall that read, Your soul belongs to me. Just then, a multitude of hands reach out from all four of the walls surrounding you and grabs your legs and arms. Unable to move, you yell for help, hoping someone will hear you. But you will know it's pointless. You feel the horrible pain of your hands holding you as they start to tear apart. You yell louder and louder with every crack and pop coming from each limb being torn off your body. First your legs, then your arms. Then they tear your body into half. You feel the blood gushing on your face and you feel every blood organ being pulled from inside you. You start to yell for the pain to stop and start to cry tears of blood. Nothing could help you now. Blood was all over the walls and on what was left of you. You start to feel cold because of the air circulating in your chest. As you take your last breath, you see a little girl with pale skin and no eye in a white dress laughing as if she enjoyed your pain. And the last words you hear are, we shall be fun for you and your life. Remember that old man on the construction site in Vermilion City? He had a faithful machop flattening the ground for some mysterious construction project that they had apparently been at for all these years. There's no more to this tale. The story begins in Lavender Town. Lavender Town chapter of Pokemon Red and Blue was short, but left a profound impact on the player. Team Rocket was at it again, stealing the skulls of Cubones in the tower. Local celebrity Mr. Fuji attempted to stop them, but was easily subdued and taken hostage. You, the valiant hero, rescued Mr. Fuji and put an end to Team Rocket's new furious plot. The story was juvenile, but there seemed to be so much more to it. Perhaps it is the music that played. It sounds quite simply like fear. It lent an ambience and an intensity not present elsewhere in the game. 
No wonder it is recalled with such vividness as all we grew up playing the game. But isn't it curious that a town so dedicated to preserving the resting place of Pokemon, a mere three years later the tower had been replaced with a radio tower? Lavender Town had obviously changed the first time you traveled there in gold and silver. Aside from the aesthetic changes, the music flow is lighthearted and whimsical, entirely different in mood from the previous generation. But beneath the cheerful arrangement of the music was the same haunting melody. Things were not simply as they appeared. You see, there was more to Team Rocket's involvement than you had imagined. Lavender Town, during the time of Red and Blue, was struggling. It was a town without a draw. It lacked a Pokemon gym or anything else to attract tourists. Fuchsia had a safari zone. Pewter had a museum. Cinnabar had a famous laboratory. But all Lavender Town had was a massive graveyard that was free to visit. Its feeble Pokemon paled in comparison to Celadon's department store, which was easily accessible through the underground path to the west. Lavender Town was easily the poorest town in Kanto. One day, a businessman approached the mayor of Lavender Town with a proposition. Radio was a fed that had been taken nearby in the Johto region in a storm. He proposed the demolition of the Pokemon Tower and the construction of the radio tower in its place. It would be entirely funded by the man's business company, built at no cost to Lavender Town. The mayor realized this would greatly upset the residents. He also realized that it was an opportunity for prosperity. The town was desperate. He accepted, even though the condition came with the businessman's plan. Cubones are indigenous to Lavender Town. Their skulls were extremely valuable on the black market. The businessman's condition was that his organization would be able to hunt the Cubones. The profits from the skulls would be funded for the construction of the radio tower. Who is the businessman? Giovanni. The mayor of Lavender Town? Mr. Fuji. Red was simply a pawn in this plot. He rescued Mr. Fuji in order to deflect the growing suspicion of the involvement with Team Rocket. And as he left town and continued on his journey, Team Rocket quickly resumed the extermination of Cubones. The plan appears to be unconcerned with the souls of the resting Pokemon. It was anything but. Giovanni was a very superstitious man. The takeover of the Sylph Company was done, so that Team Rocket would be able to mass-produce Sylph scopes which would be distributed to grunts involved in the Lavender Project. He also believed in demolishing the tower would disrupt the spirits of the Pokemon inside, so he planned to construct a new tower. The bodies would be moved there before the demolition would take place. He knew the perfect place for the new tower. An empty hill in Vermilion. Giovanni hired a small independent construction company to build this tower so that people will not suspect Team Rocket's involvement. The old man's company used a Pokemon labor force. Machops. The construction was problematic. It suffered through a string of increasingly bizarre disasters. The funds originally allocated to the company were lost in the bank robbery. There were inexplicable machine failures, as well as the death of several Machops. Once passed, and the project still stalled, making seemingly no progress. The citizens of Vermilion had no idea what the construction was intended for, joked that it was cursed. This would explain the continuing tragedy that befell on the Machops. Those attacks could not affect ghosts. Nonetheless, Giovanni refused to begin the construction of the radio tower until the bodies could be transferred to a new resting place. His greatest fear was disturbing the spirits. Some of his followers came to view him as delusional. He seemed to believe that the ghosts were trying to communicate with him, and that he had in fact disturbed the spirits already, causing their activity in Vermilion. His defeat at the hands of Red, a ten-year-old boy, validated his apprehensions that he could no longer lead an organization that expected him to carry out a plan that now feared the consequences of. He relinquished his power and disappeared. The new leaders of Team Rocket shared few superstitions 
apprehensions. The tower was demolished the next day. Strangely, the old man who owned the Vermilion Construction Company died the same day. The construction site upon the hill remains in Vermilion City today. It is abandoned, a flat patch of earth, barren, except for a few tombstones under which the deceased Machops lay. The only feature that resembles on the planned Pokemon Tower that never was. People that visit it feel unease. Some claim to hear a faint, very sad melody. Most avoid this place, but occasionally, a traveler from Jota will unknowingly stumble upon it. They claim to see an old man in the Machop, continuously stomping the ground flat for an important construction project. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday.